uh, ICANX talks. I would say easily the best forum of we have right now in material science in the world. Um, I'm uh, today's uh, moderator. I'm Christian Nijhuis. I'm at the University of Twente. And I'm also, uh, yeah, I'm a chair of the uh, nano electronics group here at the University of Twente and also the vice director of the Molecule Center. And it's a real great pleasure uh, to host Manish today. And of course, uh, this is uh, one of the series, one of the lectures of the MACE topics, which is all, all about light and energy. We already had two great talks earlier this month. As already mentioned, today is Manish's turn. Uh, and next week was supposed to be uh, Harry Edwards to give a contribution, but unfortunately he cannot make it. But instead we have a very special uh, Shanghai session to support all the people uh, and all of our friends in Shanghai. Um, this is the today's uh, uh, panel. Uh, we have an ex-challenger, two panelists who will try to ask really tough questions to today's speaker. Manish Chowala. Well, Manish, uh, I know him uh, quite well. We met, I think, uh, for the first time around, uh, yeah, I think it was 2017 in Singapore when he was a visiting professor there. And of course, uh, uh, after that, he visited Singapore a, a few more times. Uh, but I, th I think we all know him. He is, of course, an authority in 2D materials and especially in uh, TMDCs. And I think uh, around uh, 2018, he moved from Rutgers University uh, to Cambridge, where he is a goldsmith professor of material science. Yeah, and I think, uh, oh yeah, maybe it's also very important to mention, of course, uh, he started an, a new journal, Applied Materials Today, as an editor-in-chief. And I think since 2016, he's out, uh, soon after that, one year after that, he started as an uh, associate editor in ACS Nano. And... I think he's also one of the highest cited scientists we have. So he has been on the Clifford highly cited researches since 2016. So with, without further delays, I would like to give the dance floor to Manish. Okay, thank, thanks very much, uh, Christian. Um, if you stop sharing, I should be able to share my screen. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, can you just confirm that you're able to see my slides? Yes, I can see your slides. Okay, that's great. Thanks very much, uh, Christian, uh, for that kind introduction, and also uh, uh, to Alice and the organizers of uh, ICANX for uh, the invitation to uh, uh, to speak at this uh, amazing uh, forum. I've I've seen many of the other talks, either live or um, after the recordings, and, and, and they're extremely uh, powerful and useful. So I'll try to uh, live up to that um, reputation. Um, and I'll, I'll sort of give uh, an overview of some of the work that we've been doing uh, with these metallic phases of two-dimensional molybdenum disulfide. So this is the archetypical transmission, uh, transition metal dichalcogenide um, layer, um, and we've been using it for, for basically catalysis and energy storage, so supercapacitors, and more recently, lithium sulfur batteries. So as Chris, uh, Christian said, I am uh, at the University of Cambridge. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch with me, please email me uh, after the talk uh, if you have any questions um, on the presentation. So let's get started. Okay, so. Yeah, so what are these uh, transition metal dichalcogenides? Well, if we look at the uh, periodic table, we have our group four to 10 transition metals. Uh, and if we combine them with these chalcogens, sulfur, selenium, or tellurium, uh, in the form of this chemical formula, MX2, where MX, M is the transition metal and X is the chalcogen, then we can make about 40 odd compounds uh, of uh, uh, these TMDCs. Uh, and these compounds have really interesting uh, properties. They can be semiconducting, they can be narrow band metals. Uh, they possess interesting uh, magnetic uh, properties as well and other condensed matter properties. Uh, and the electronic structure of these transition metal dichalcogenides is primarily controlled by the transition metal. That is the density of states from the transition metal lie closest to the Fermi level 
So they dictate the optical and electronic properties. These uh, Chalky genes have energy levels that are deep within the gap uh, and therefore do not contribute to the overall properties in a significant way. Now we know that these uh, transition metal dichalcogenides in this chemical formula form these layered uh, compounds, right? So these layered compounds are similar uh, to graphite in the sense that they're characterized by strong in-plane bonding while weak out-of-plane bonding. And this allows us to then isolate individual layers uh, of these TMDCs. Um, and therefore we go from a bulk layer material uh, to a 2D uh, material. And in contrast to graphene, which is pure carbon, uh, the uh, TMDCs are characterized uh, by a monolayer that contains three atoms. So you have the transition metal in the, in the center and the transition metal is sandwiched by these chalcogen atoms. Um, and so uh, we can isolate these individual sheets. Uh, they can be in uh, the semiconducting form. So they're, the, their electronic properties are characterized by their um, uh, actual atomic structure. So in the case of molybdenum disulfide, the 2H phase or the 1H phase for a monolayer is the semiconducting form. So we can make good transistors and electronic devices uh, out of this 2H form. It's in the trigonal, the unit cell is in trigonal prismatic. We can also have uh, molybdenum disulfide exist in what's called the 1T phase. This is in the octahedral uh, configuration. And this 1T phase is metallic. Uh, and we've utilized chemistry uh, in our group uh, over the last dozen years or so to go between the semiconducting and metallic phase. The metallic phase of these TMDCs is particularly interesting because you have a metal that now is uh, essentially atomically uh, thin. And of course, that's fundamentally a difficult thing to do. If you take a pure metal like aluminum or uh, any other metal, it will readily react with the environment and be inherently unstable. So to be able to isolate these uh, atomically thin sheets um, and for them to be metals uh, is, is quite significant because it opens up lots of different uh, interesting applications, especially in electrochemistry. So the reason why these um, materials are stable is because the bonds in the individual sheet are essentially fully passivated. So the activation energy for reaction with the environment uh, is, is uh, quite high. Now, of course, one, could, uh, one knows that there's another family of 2D materials called maxines, uh, which are also uh, metallic. I think the fundamental difference between maxines and, and uh, these metallic PMDCs that I'll talk about uh, is that uh, these transition metals um, are, have interesting properties, especially in catalysis. Um, and also they tend to be a bit more stable than, than uh, maxines. So what is the structure of this individual sheet of uh, TMDC? So here I've shown the trigonal prismatic, which is a semiconducting phase, uh, and the structure of the octahedral, which is the metallic phase. So if you look at the MOS2 sheets from the top, uh, they resemble the uh, hexagonal structure of graphene that we're all familiar with. But if you look at it from the side view, we see that, that this single layer, it consists of these three atoms as I mentioned uh, before. In the case of the um, uh, hexagonal uh, phase, the 2H phase, the sulfur atoms uh, in this case are directly located above and below uh, one another. In the octahedral configuration, the sulfur atoms have moved slightly. So you see that they're not uh, directly on top uh, and bottom of each other. And so if you look at the structure, the octahedral structure from the top view, uh, we can see that there's a sulfur atom in the middle of the, the hexagonal uh, structure. This very slight change in the structure leads to dramatic changes in the electronic properties. So as I said, this is a, a, a two, nearly two EV band gap semiconductor, and this uh, is essentially a metal. Um, and so again, I'll be talking about the metal phase. So how do we make uh, these materials? Well, um, and, and how do we do the phase transformation? So the phase trans transformation is really uh, interesting uh, because it occurs at room temperature and room pressure. So this is another sort of uh, interesting aspect of these, these uh, 2D metallic TMDCs because we can, we can achieve phase transformation at ambient conditions. We know that, that to achieve different phases uh, in materials, 
typically requires high pressure uh, or and or high temperature. So the methodology that we use is, is actually quite an old methodology. It was first pioneered by a Canadian scientist. Uh, okay. So um, the the, uh, the the synthesis method was first pioneered by a Canadian uh, academic called Bob Frind. Um, and he developed this N-butyllithium chemistry way back in the 70s and, and 80s. Um, and he has uh, a paper showing an image like this uh, in 1986 uh, entitled Single Layer uh, MOS2. So we, we've, we've taken uh, the, the recipe that he, he developed, modified it, um, and, and expanded uh, upon it. Uh, it but it's, this is a tried and trusted uh, method. So what we do is we start with um, molybdenum disulfide powder, uh, and we reduce the uh, MOS2 by N-butyl lithium. Um, and this N-butyl lithium uh, chemistry leads to uh, charge transfer to the uh, uh, MOS2, and this additional electron in the d orbital of molybdenum uh, drives the phase transformation from the 2H to 1T. In addition, to the phase transformation, the intercalation of uh, the uh, lithium between the layers expands uh, the distance between the layers. So then it becomes very facile uh, to, to exfoliate these um, TMDCs into individual sheets as shown here. So what you end up with after this reaction uh, is uh, lots of uh, uh, single layer metallic phase uh, MOS2 sheets that can be dispersed quite easily in water or other solvents. And the phase transformation is characterized by uh, features in the Raman. So for example, if you were to measure Raman after exfoliation, uh, you would uh, see these characteristics J1, J2, and J3 peaks uh, at low wave numbers. Um, and then because the 1T phase is metastable, we can also relax the 1T phase back to the 2H phase by doing annealing uh, for a couple of hours in an in a inert environment. And we can see that uh, by annealing at 300 degrees C, where we can uh, see that the J1, J2 peaks disappear, uh, and we have the emergence of the usual A1, E1 and A, uh, A1G peaks that you get in uh, a typical MOS2 crystal. We can quantify the amount of uh, 1T phase concentration uh, that, uh, that uh, 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 the reaction gives by, uh, sorry, by XPS, um, where uh, we can fit the different contribution of the 1T component, and the 2H component, uh, and obtain the fraction of the 1T phase concentration. So when we do this reaction, we typically have sheets of uh, MOS2 uh, 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 nanosheets, um, and we can achieve, within those nanosheets, we can achieve one T phase concentration of up to 80%. Uh, so you have complete percolation between the metallic, uh, within the metallic phase to render the sheet uh, uh, metallic. We can check that the phase transformation has happened by photoluminescence. So we know that monolayers of semiconducting MOS2 uh, have this characteristic PL, um, and of course, the metallic phase, uh, in the metallic phase, the PL is quenched. We can, by doing annealing, recover the PL. So we know that, that it is actually the phase of the material that's changing and not some, some uh, chemistry in the material. Okay, so one thing that um, we found very early on with these metallic uh, phases of uh, MOS2, as well as tungsten disulfide, is that they're catalytically active for evolving uh, hydrogen within the hydrogen evolution reaction. So of course, HGR we know is half of the reaction for splitting uh, water. Uh, and to characterize the catalytic activity of uh, molybdenum disulfide, one uh, plots what's called the polarization curves where the current density uh, as a function of a potential with respect to a reference hydrogen electrode uh, is plotted. And to compare the performance of a new catalyst, uh, typically uh, platinum is used as a reference because platinum does not have any overpotential for the HVR reaction. Uh, and its TAFO slope gives you an indication of the kinetics of the reaction is also quite low. And we can see that the metallic 1T phase uh, actually has 
uh, reasonably good uh, catalytic uh, activity compared to the semiconducting uh, phase. We can then plot the overpotential as a function of current density uh, to obtain these linear relationships from which we can uh, extract with the, the Tafel slope. And we see that the Tafel slope for platinum is on the order of 30 uh, millivolt per decade. For MOS2, uh, it's on the order of 40 millivolt per decade. So of course, these materials will never be as good as platinum for HER, but these overpotential and Tafel slope values suggest that they are good catalysts for um, for the HER uh, reaction. Uh, and so uh, we, we correlated the catalytic activity by plotting the exchange current density. This is the, the exchange current that takes place at, at zero volt as a function of the 1T phase concentration. So we can see that by tuning the phase concentration, we can increase the catalytic activity by an order of magnitude. Um, we've also studied since our sort of initial study on demonstrating that these materials are active for the HER reaction. We studied the fundamental uh, mechanisms of what makes a good HER catalyst. So in the next few slides, I'll take you through um, those, uh, those uh, uh, basic results. So in a, in a HER setup, in a hydrogen evolution reaction setup, um, what we have typically is a, uh, a host for the catalyst, so a substrate. So this is typically glassy carbon on which the catalysts are, are, are uh, deposited. And this is typically immersed within an electrolyte, which is uh, usually sulfuric acid. So you have lots of protons that are floating around in the uh, electrolyte that's used for evolving the hydrogen from. So there are three major steps in a hydrogen evolution reaction. So HER in many ways is, the, is, is a very simple reaction. So it allows us, to study, uh, allows us to study the fundamental characteristics of new catalyst uh, materials uh, in, a, in a rational and careful way. So um, the first step in a HER reaction is that uh, electrons are injected into the catalyst from our uh, substrate. Um, and so, when electrons, uh, when the cathode, when when the substrate is held at a cathode potential, the electrons are injected. Uh, what this means is the electrons from the glassy carbon have to go into uh, the catalyst. In this case, the metallic phase, uh, MOS two, uh, and so that electron injection step is essentially the charge transfer resistance, right? Transferring charge from the substrate to the catalyst. And then once the charge is injected, the electron is injected into the catalyst, it has to be transported to the active site. The entire surface is not catalytically active. There are specific thermodynamic sites where the HER reaction occurs. Uh, and the third step is that when the electron reaches the active site, it has to combine with the proton, so you have adsorbed hydrogen. And when you have sufficient number of hydrogens adsorbed on the surface, there's a driving force for them to evolve as H2 gas. Um, and so the adsorption and the desorption energy for an ideal HER catalyst should be thermoneutral. That is the delta G um, is, should be essentially zero. And so we've studied all of these different uh, steps in an HER a reaction for uh, metallic uh, MOS2 uh, to understand how to improve uh, it, uh, the, the properties of the catalyst, but also uh, to understand the fundamental mechanisms. So I'll, I'll briefly take you through that. To study the influence of uh, charge transfer resistance and also the influence of um, different phases on the catalytic activity, uh, we uh, pioneered these uh, microelectrochemical cells. These are little uh, tiny HER uh, uh, reactors that we fabricate using uh, lithography uh, on a single flake of molybdenum disulfide. So, we typically grow molybdenum disulfide by chemical vapor deposition. You might be able to see the triangles behind. Um, and what, we, what we're interested in is to understand what the influence of the charge transfer resistance is. So in this kind of device, that would simply be the contact resistance between the molybdenum disulfide and the metal contact. We're also interested in whether the 2H phase is active for HER or the 1T phase uh, is active for, for HER. Um, and so we can open up very well-defined windows by lithography. So the electrolyte is only exposed to specific regions of the MOS2, two-dimensional MOS2 nanosheet. 
So for example, we can measure the activity of the basal plane, uh, or we can measure the activity just from the edge of uh, MOS2. Um, and so this, this is a very powerful technique and it's been utilized widely now in the literature to understand the basic properties of, of uh, catalysts and, and identify active sites uh, on different types of catalysts. So uh, first thing that we studied was um, the influence of, of uh, charge transfer uh, resistance. So we made some microelectrochemical cells with different um, contact resistance, that is the resistance between um, the uh, catalyst and the substrate, one can do this by lithographic patterning and by phase engineering. You can tune the contact resistance and study its uh, HER performance. And it's not surprising that, uh, that uh, the uh, device with the lowest contact resistance gives us the best uh, catalytic activity, right? Um, but this is important because um, the charge transfer resistance, that is the support on which the catalyst is placed, uh, is significantly important. So if you designed a catalyst with very high concentration of uh, active sites, but if you had poor contact uh, charge transfer resistance, or very high transfer resistance between um, the catalyst and the support, um, you would have this bottleneck in, in the catalytic activity. So, so it is important to engineer the interaction between the catalyst and the support uh, to achieve the best uh, catalytic performance. Uh, otherwise, there's a bottleneck in the, in the series uh, resistance. Uh, we've also uh, aimed to study step three, which is the uh, thermodynamics of uh, the catalytic uh, uh, activity. We want to get to a point where the delta G for hydrogen, the proton adsorption and hydrogen desorption to be uh, close to zero. Uh, and to do this, uh, we not only create active sites in the form of sulfur vacancies, it's the molybdenum that acts as the active site. So of course we can access the molybdenum in the MOS2 quite easily by introducing sulfur uh, vacancies. Uh, and what we found is that uh, so these were rationally um, designed sulfur vacancies using a helium ion beam. So what you're seeing here is an atomic resolution image of a molybdenum uh, disulfide. Um, and uh, these circles, these orange circles, show where there's a sulfur atom that's been missing. If you uh, tune the concentration of sulfur vacancies using a helium ion beam, uh, then you can achieve the right concentration to increase the activity of uh, the uh, MOS2. But the introduction of sulfur vacancy also introduces local strain. So if you look at this, these dashed red lines that are perfectly horizontal, you can see that the atomic plane is shifted from the horizontal line. This indicates that there is a local um, uh, change in the local bonding which of course uh, introduces strain locally. Uh, and strain is a very important factor in, in determining the thermodynamics. Uh, and we've estimated uh, strain by uh, measuring these local distances to be around two to 3% uh, in, uh, in these metallic phase uh, MOS2 in the presence of vacancies. So then in, in 2013, we uh, did this free energy calculation for the rate limiting reaction in HER um, and what we found is that in our sample, so this is a strain map of our 1T or 1T prime uh, MOS2 uh, tungsten disulfide sample. Uh, and this colorful image shows bright regions and also dark regions. And these are local regions of compressive and tensile strain that's on the order of uh, 2 to 3%, uh, around 2, uh, 2 to 3%. And what we found was that when we did the, the, the free energy calculation, when you have uh, uh, MOS2 in the, or tungsten disulfide in the 1T phase uh, configuration, if that configuration is also accompanied by strain on the order of 2.7%, then we see that the delta G um, at that strain value is zero, which is the ideal condition, the thermal neutral condition that we desire for um, the HER reaction to proceed. Uh, and this was verified by the group uh, from uh, Stanford, uh, Stanford, where they plotted the delta G as a function of strain 
at different sulfur vacancy concentrations, right? So we sh I showed you in the previous slide that it's the sulfur vacancies, that is the exposure of the molybdenum uh, ion that, that is responsible for, uh, for the uh, catalytic activity. So one can see that at the right sort of vacancy concentration and the right sort of strain, um, you can achieve thermoneutral conditions. I didn't talk about our sulfur vacancy work, but we, we um, have rationally designed uh, the concentration of sulfur vacancies using sulfur um, uh, helium ion beam. And we find that our experimental results are actually quite consistent with uh, these uh, calculations from the Stanford group, as well as uh, our group then earlier. Okay, so um, let me shift gears a little bit to talk about energy storage with uh, metallic uh, 1T phase MOS2. So as I said, we do this butyl lithium chemistry and what we end up with is a suspension, a colloidal suspension of these individual metallic phase MOS2 sheets floating around in, in liquid. So we can use various different techniques to then reassemble or restack these nano sheets into um, electrodes. Uh, the simplest way of doing this is uh, vacuum uh, filtration. And then we end up with these beautiful uh, electrodes that are flexible um, and uh, easily uh, handleable because they're, they're quite robust. If we look at what these electrodes look like in a scanning electron microscope in a cross section, what we see uh, is that unlike the perfect crystal, uh, we have a restacked electrode uh, of what looks like crumpled pieces of paper that have been restacked. So a crystal would be a nice um, brand new um, stack of, of paper that's perfectly crisp. Um, the, this um, restack uh, electrodes look more like crumpled uh, pieces of, uh, of paper. And if we do a slightly higher magnification imaging, we see that within, between uh, these uh, crumpled uh, sheets, there's uh, lots of opportunity for ions to intercalate and deintercalate from uh, for energy storage. One important thing to, to point out is that um, the metallic phase of MOS2 is hydrophilic or lyophilic. So it's able to wet um, uh, with uh, the, the electrolyte that's used in many electrochemical applications, including catalysis. Um, the electrolyte is able to wet the, the electrode quite nicely which um, enhances uh, interactions and, and reactions that we, we desire. So we can then characterize our restacked electrodes in the, in the usual way to confirm that they're 1T and uh, 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 the usual sort of uh, properties. Right, so uh, a few years ago, we, we uh, measured the uh, energy storage capability of these restacked uh, electrodes. Um, in the form of supercapacitors. And the results of that study are shown uh, here. So the cyclic voltometry data where we plotted the capacitance, the gravimetric capacitance as a function of uh, uh, potential uh, are shown here for different electrolytes. And one can see that if you just make electrodes from the semiconducting uh, MOS2, uh, it's not sufficiently conducting. Um, it's too insulating uh, to give any appreciable uh, capacitance value. However, we, uh, with the metallic phase uh, 1T MOS2, uh, we can see that we get these nice CV curves uh, and there's, uh, there's a substantial uh, and significant amount of uh, charge storage. The curve for the um, sulfuric acid where protons are the, are the uh, ions is slightly different, and this is uh, it can be understood by the fact that there's local redox reaction that that happens uh, with protons. So um, one can one can see that there's a capability for for large uh, capacity, uh, large amount of ion storage in these electrodes. Um, it was not clear at the time uh, for us whether the intercalation and deintercalation that was giving rise to this capacity was coming from the cations or the anions in these electrolytes. So there's a very simple sort of sanity check that we can do um, by having, uh, by changing, um, keeping the cation the same, but changing the anion. And we see that the CV curve looks identical, suggesting it's the potassium that's intercalating and not the anion. The um, intercalation and deintercalation dynamics of, of the ions in these electrodes is quite uh, fast and, and efficient. 
Uh, and that's indicated by these this rate dependence, where we can see that even at rates of around 200 millivolts per second, uh, we're able to preserve the sort of rectangular CV uh, characteristics. Um, and so we can summarize our data uh, in, in uh, the, the storage capability of these electrodes in the form of volumetric capacitance as a function of scan rate. And we can see that at low scan rates, we're able to achieve volumetric capacitance um, that's quite high. Uh, there are other electrodes that, that have uh, reported higher things, but at the time, um, this was uh, uh, quite reasonable. And, and what's uh, interesting um, about this uh, was that in 20, in the mid sort of to 20 uh, teens, uh, there was a lot of interest in making high surface area electrodes for supercapacitors. The surface area of these restacked MOS2 is actually quite small. It's on the order of 10 meters squared per gram. Um, so, but, but the charge storage is efficient due to intercalation and deintercalation between the sheets. And so because the surface area is quite small, the volumetric capacity is, is high, right? So if you have large surface area electrodes, then you need lots of volume uh, to have the same capacity, which reduces your volumetric capacity. Your gravimetric capacity might be high, but the volumetric capacity is low. So this was a, a little bit different uh, at the time because we were not relying on the high surface area for capacity. Instead, we we're relying on the efficiency of the intercalation and deintercalation process. And we did X, uh, XC2 uh, uh, XRD uh, to show um, that, that there's an expansion of, of the spacing uh, between the nano sheet that gives rise to the large capacity. And so uh, one thing that, that my student noticed when he was doing the um, supercapacitor measurements was that these electrodes uh, of uh, restacked electrodes are able to expand and contract uh, quite dramatically uh, during uh, um, charging and discharging of the electrodes. Uh, and so he utilized this uh, to, to make these uh, uh, electrochemical uh, actuators. So this is just basically a freestanding one T phase MOS2 strip uh, that's been coated with gold. Uh, and so uh, this is immersed in an electrolyte and he's applying uh, voltage, positive and negative voltage uh, to actuate uh, the, uh, uh, the strip. Um, and, and so uh, this is quite interesting because uh, it, it allowed us to then calculate the physical properties of the restacked film. Um, so uh, by applying positive voltage and negative voltage, uh, we're able to make the cantilever actuate in, in the positive and, and negative direction. Uh, and the change in curvature is directly correlated uh, to the CV characteristic, and that is the intercalation of um, uh, ions and, and deintercalation of ion leads to uh, this uh, actuation in, in both directions. And so one can do um, lots of different uh, uh, measurements with different thicknesses of uh, MOS2 and on different substrates. Uh, and by fitting that data, we can extract the uh, Young's modulus of these restacked MOS2 films, which comes out to around 2.3 uh, gigapascals and the strain capability of these actuators is on the order of 0.8%. Uh, percent. Uh, and so that's all great, but uh, I challenged my student to, to sort of come up with a device that would um, actually demonstrate uh, the, what these actuators were useful for. So he, he designed uh, this bimorph uh, actuator, uh, which is completely jointless, just it's simply by patterning the, the MOS2 and cutting uh, the, the um, a substrate, uh, which is polyamide, um, in the right sort of way, you can actually make a little device uh, which is capable of uh, lifting weights. So the one TMOS2 film is strategically placed in these sort of black locations as indicated here. Uh, and by um, intercalating and deintercalating, we can get expansion or contraction of the film, which leads to uh, the lifting uh, of the weight or releasing uh, of the weight. And what's interesting is that uh, we can uh, have an active material that's only 1.6 milligrams, uh, but it's capable of lifting a weight uh, that is 265 milligrams, so over 150 times its, its uh, uh, own weight. Uh, and we did some calculations to um, understand the amount of electrochemical energy that's uh, converted to mechanical work, uh, and we can achieve efficiency values that are quite, quite reasonable. Uh, 
Um, the main sort of challenge with these types of actuators is that this is all done immersed in electrolyte, right? So, so for for practical robotics and other uh, devices, one would have to come up with a solid state uh, electrolyte um, that uh, uh, would allow us to exploit this actuation um, mechanism outside of the liquid. Okay, so in the in the last sort of few minutes, uh, uh, the last part of my talk, I'd just like to um, uh, discuss some of our, our latest work on lithium sulfur batteries uh, using a metallic 1T uh, MOS2 for uh, cathodes or cathode hosts uh, for, for lithium sulfur batteries. So this work uh, is uh, part of this LISTAR uh, consortium. So the LISTAR stands for lithium sulfur a technology accelerator, uh, and it's funded by the Faraday Institution in the UK. So the Faraday Institution in the UK funds research to enable the transition uh, from combust uh, combustion engines to uh, electric vehicles. Uh, and so lithium sulfur battery is a big part uh, of that uh, transition, uh, and the LifeStar Consortium has over 100 researchers from around uh, the UK. And we're looking at all different aspects of the lithium sulfur battery. Uh, the, uh, the, my main responsibility is to optimize the cathode uh, performance, um, but there are um, um, researchers looking at the anode uh, as well as the electrolyte, et cetera. So in a lithium sulfur battery, what we have is um, sulfur, pure sulfur powder acting as the uh, cathode and a pure lithium acting as the uh, anode. And it's the reaction between the lithium and the sulfur um, that leads to the capacity. I'll show you the reaction that's responsible for the, for the capacity. But there are some basic problems that must be overcome uh, for the lithium sulfur battery. First uh, is that the sulfur is not conducting, pure sulfur powder is not conducting. So typically what's done is that uh, you have a conducting scaffold on which the sulfur is loaded. Uh, and the conducting scaffold is typically porous carbon. Um, of course, if you use pure lithium as the anode, there are lots of issues uh, related to uh, formation of uh, dendrites, uh, but also the um, reaction between the lithium and sulfur forms polysulfide. And there's this effect of polysulfide shuttling uh, which can also lead to capacity fading of the uh, of the battery. So, uh, so just to sum up, um, the starting active material is S8. The final uh, products that we we end up with in the lithium sulfur batteries Li2S. Both of these are uh, electrically uh, insulating, and, and so to mitigate for this, there's a large amount of inactive carbon that's uh, that that uh, is added. And this sulfur uh, reduction reaction takes place by uh, several different uh, in intermediates that can diffuse uh, and react with the lithium uh, anode, leading to irreversibly, irreversible inventory loss. Polysulfide shuttling is also a, a problem which can reduce coulombic efficiency and overall capacity. Uh, there's also challenges with uh, expansion of the, of the electrodes that must be overcome. So I'm only going to talk about how we've replaced the um, porous carbon with metallic 1TMOS2 uh, as cathodes and how that leads to dramatic improvement in the performance of state-of-the-art lithium sulfur batteries. So if we go back one step, why do we use carbons? As I said, the carbons um, uh, act as the conducting uh, scaffold for the sulfur. Because the, the lithium sulfur battery uh, react, uh, uh, is based on these different reactions between lithium and sulfur and the sulfur reduction reaction, there's typically a uh, catalyst that is added to the porous carbon. Um, and then the sulfur is loaded onto the electrode. Okay. Uh, the problem with using porous carbon uh, is that because it, it's high surface area and because you want the reaction to occur uh, in every uh, part of the sulfur, uh, um, that's on the porous carbon, one has to apply lots of uh, electrolyte to flood the pores of the porous carbon. And that increases the weight of the uh, battery, but it also increases the electrolyte to sulfur ratio. So ideally, 
uh, a lithium sulfur battery will have electrolyte to sulfur ratio that's on the order of uh, four or lower. Um, if you deposit the electrocatalyst on porous carbon, then there is a series resistance, right? The, the electrocatalyst is typically an oxide or non-conducting material. Um, and so the, um, the charge has to be transferred from the porous carbon to the electro, uh, electro uh, catalyst, which, lead, uh, which can introduce series uh, resistance or interfacial resistance. And also uh, carbons are hydrophobic. And so the wettability with electrolyte is, is uh, quite low. So this plot here shows that if you, it's the electrolyte to sulfur ratio uh, that is uh, important. So if you can decrease the electrolyte to sulfur ratio, you can achieve a higher capacity um, that is uh, independent of the sulfur loading after a certain concentration. So adding more active material in sulfur does not really help. Um, it's the reducing of the electrolyte to sulfur ratio that helps. So as I said, um, when we looked at the basic properties of the metallic 1T phase MOS2, uh, we know that it's highly conducting. We know that it has a low surface area. We know that it's highly um, lyophilic. Uh, and we also know that it can catalyze some reactions. We don't know if it will catalyze the sulfur reduction reaction, but we know that it has some catalytic uh, activity. So we decided to implement the 1T phase MOS2 uh, as the electrode for lithium sulfur batteries. And so uh, in lithium sulfur battery, the overall capacity is obtained from this reaction uh, as well. It's the reduction of the sulfur to this polysulfide, uh, which is Li2S. And in this reaction, 16 electrons are transferred. So the overall theoretical capacity because of this in a lithium sulfur battery uh, is actually uh, dramatically higher than a lithium ion battery. It's 1600 milliamp hour per gram compared to 372 milliamp hour per gram for, for lithium ion battery. So that's where the excitement in lithium sulfur battery uh, uh, occurs. So if one looks at the galvanostatic charge discharge characteristics of a lithium sulfur uh, battery, so here I've shown curves for different uh, MOS2 uh, electrodes. So this is uh, the semiconducting. Uh, MOS2 to, uh, uh, to increase the conductivity of the MOS2. We've added carbon uh, and made some electrodes from that uh, and different concentration of uh, 1P phase MOS2. And we see that, that the pure uh, 2H uh, MOS2, the semiconducting phase is too insulating to give any uh, measurable uh, capacity. Uh, if we add some carbon, things improve a little bit as indicated by this green curve. But we see that the metallic phase um, uh, MOS2 gives us the best capacity values, reaching a maximum of 1425 milliamp hour per gram. Um, and if we take 1600 to be our theoretical capacity, we can see that that's responsible for 85% of sulfur utilization. If we examine these curves a little bit more closely, we see that there are two distinct plateaus, right? There's one here that happens at around 2.4 volts. And another one, which is the long one here, that happens at around 2.1 volt. This plateau at 2.1 volt is the uh, uh, polysulfide reduction uh, Li2S S4 to Li2S2 or Li2S. And this is responsible for 75% of the capacity of the lithium sulfur battery. It also takes the longest time to proceed. Um, so optimization of this reaction is really the key uh, to to uh, uh, having good lithium uh, sulfur batteries. So I'm going to show you why um, this uh, one T phase MOS2 works so well and gives us uh, very high capacity. I should point out that the data that I'm showing you now in this slide are for coin cells, okay? And when you make coin cells for battery research, um, the, you typically use uh, conditions that are most favorable uh, for demonstrating the capabilities of your um, electrode material. So um, I'll show you the conditions that we use for coin cells. Uh, they're not realistic, but then towards the end, I'll show you realistic conditions uh, for practical tout cells that we've made as well. Uh, but this gives us a good indication of what our what the capability of the 1T phase MOS2 is. And you can see that it's, it's quite promising. So why is it uh, that, that's, uh, that, that MOS2 uh, work so well. 
Well, in the case of uh, lithium sulfur battery, what you'd like to do, what you'd like to have, you'd like to have the sulfur uh, adsorbed onto your uh, cathode scaffold, in this case, one TMOS2. You'd like to have um, the polysulfide or the sulfur reduction reaction happen on the cathode rather than the polysulfide dissolving into uh, the electrolyte where they can go to the, to the lithium anode um, and, and uh, destroy the capacity. And so the way to, to um, sort of check whether um, the sulfur remains um, adsorbed onto the scaffold uh, is to uh, look at the adsorption capability of the different polysulfides uh, on to the different cathode material. So we've done that here in this uh, uv vis diagram, where what we've done is uh, we've taken a solution of uh, this Li2S4 polysulfide. So remember, this is the polysulfide that uh, is reduced uh, in, in the um, galvanostatic discharge uh, curves at 2.1 volt. So it's the reduction of this polysulfide that is crucially important because it's responsible for 75% of the capacity. So we wanted to see what the adsorption capability of this polysulfide uh, onto different electrodes was. So we measured the adsorption spectrum of Li2S4, that's indicated by this uh, curve here. Um, but when we uh, add different electrodes to this solution, we see that some of that polysulfide is adsorbed onto the different electrodes. Um, and, and for the uh, one T phase MOS2, the solution becomes um, quite clear and the absorption is dramatically diminished. What this means is that the Li2S has strong affinity to the 1T phase MOS2, and it prefers to remain on the surface for the reaction to occur rather than dissolving into the, into the uh, electrolyte. We one sort of another important parameter for the lithium sulfur reaction to proceed uh, in an efficient manner is that the lithium ions that have come from the anode should diffuse through the electrode uh, very efficiently so that it can react with the sulfur um, uniformly throughout the electrode. Uh, and so for that, we can um, uh, get an idea of what the lithium diffusion constant is in the uh, different uh, electrode materials. And we use uh, something called the Randall's uh, sub uh, subject equation, and uh, we obtain um, the parameters uh, for this equation by doing CV measurements, um, and in the CV measurements, we see that there are these two uh, cathodic peaks and one uh, anodic peaks. Uh, we can take the different values at different scan rates, plug them into this equation, and by plotting the current density as a function of the square root of the scan rate, we can extract this parameter um, diffusion uh, uh, constant of uh, lithium. And what we find uh, is that uh, the diffusion um, uh, capability of lithium within, again, the metallic 1T phase uh, MOS2 is the highest, or it's the most efficient. So this means that the lithium can go within the 1T phase electrode that is now covered in sulfur. Uh, when and during the operation of the lithium sulfur battery, the lithium can, can um, form different polysulfides that remain adsorbed on the surface, but still give electrons that gives rise to the, to the capacity of the, of the battery. We can also uh, look at uh, the uh, series resistance or the resistance, internal resistance of uh, the lithium sulfur uh, coin cells by uh, me uh, measuring Nyquist plots as shown here. These were all done at 2.1 volt because remember that is, the, the, uh, that is where the plateau uh, that's responsible for 75% of the capacity um, occurs. And we can, we can fit these uh, Nyquist plots to this, um, to this uh, circuit diagram where we have uh, the overall resistance in the system. This is related to the electrolyte, the charge transfer resistance, um, and other sort of ohmic resistances. Um, uh, and we can also look at the, the, the resistance due to uh, the sulfur on the electrode, et cetera. Uh, and by fitting these parameters, we obtain um, these curves. And again, we see that the overall um, charge transfer resistance and series resistance of the metallic phase is significantly lower uh, than, than the other uh, electrodes. Now, um, one sort of uh, important parameter 
for the reaction to proceed, the sulfur reduction reaction uh, to proceed. Uh, I should actually go to this uh, uh, figure and then I'll come back to the previous slide. Um, it is, so we know that the 1T uh, MOS2 is catalytically active. I showed you results for the hydrogen evolution reaction, but it was perhaps wishful thinking on our part to assume that, that it would also be um, catalytically active for the sulfur reduction reaction. So to verify, uh, to, to check first whether it's um, active for SRR, uh, we measured the sulfur reduction reaction in polysulfide solution. So that's shown, those results are shown here, uh, where again, this is a very similar measurement to, to uh, uh, the HER measurement in the sense that we have a three electrode geometry, but we have a rotating disc uh, electrode here. Uh, and, and what we find is that, uh, again, the catalytic activity of the 1TMOS2 for sulfur reduction reaction in this polysulfide a solution which is responsible for most of the capacity in lithium sulfur, um, the overpotential uh, and the tapful slope um, are, the overpotential is the lowest, tapful slope is the lowest, suggesting that yes, the 1TMOS2 phase is active for the sulfur reduction reaction uh, and um, the kinetics are, are, are quite, uh, quite good. So uh, we can also then uh, check for whether the current is diffusion limited by changing the rotation speeds of the RD electrode and see indeed that that's the case. Um, so these measurements, if I go back to this uh, slide, allow us to then uh, extract what's called the activation energy for these reactions, right? So we have these two plateaus in the galvanostatic charge discharge characteristics, one at 2.4 and one at 2.1 volt. Um, and we can see from the, uh, plot of the activation energy as a function of the cell voltage, that there are these two peaks located at those two uh, plateaus. Uh, so we measured the activation energy um, using different uh, electrodes, uh, and we find that the act overall activation energy is, uh, is quite low um, for the uh, metallic phase 1TMOS2. So these reactions proceed uh, quite, quite efficiently. Um, the other sort of important point that I wanted to make in this slide was that um, you can uh, use this uh, an uh, uh, relationship, uh, the katuki levitch uh, equation, to extract the number of electrons that are involved uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in, in the reaction at 2.1 volt. So uh, the, the reduction of Li2S4 to Li2S involves 12 uh, uh, electrons, so it's responsible for 75% of the capacity. And with our 1TMOS2, uh, we can, um, through our analysis, show that we have around 10.6 uh, electrons uh, uh, participating uh, in this important reaction, which gives a conversion factor, a fraction of 88.3%, uh, which is, again, uh, you know, quite, quite um, significant and is responsible for the very high capacity that we see in our coin cell. So just as a summary of the coin cell data, uh, I discussed the galvanostatic charge discharge characteristic uh, and the specific capacity. So um, the aerial sulfur loading, so you want to utilize a uh, 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 maximum amount of sulfur that we can achieve is 7.5 milligrams per centimeter uh, squared. The electrolyte to sulfur ratio um, that we use um, is much lower than four microliters per, per milligram. Um, so the, the, uh, I'll show you in the next slide that with our pouch cells, we're able to go down to around 2.4 uh, electro, uh, electrolyte to sulfur ratio, which is among the lowest that, that, that have been uh, achieved. This gives us 85% uh, of the theoretical capacity. We get good volume uh, capacity and cycling uh, stability. So if we just plot the volumetric capacity versus the sulfur loading, um, our, our results compare reasonably favorably with, with what's been reported uh, in the in the literature. But of course, one sort of important thing to, to note is that the coin cell, as I said, uh, uses conditions that are not really practical uh, for, for a battery device. It's, it's the, you know, the, the conditions that we use for a coin cell um, are designed to give us an idea about how well the 1TMOS2 uh, could potentially behave. Uh, but to really implement the 1TMOS2 the, uh, in a practical uh, cell, 
uh, we have a dry room uh, in, in, in Cambridge uh, where we can assemble uh, these pouch cells you know, by hand. This, is a, uh, this pouch cell contains six uh, different uh, layers. Um, and we measured, uh, we implemented our 1TM OS2 uh, and achieved uh, an uh, aerial capacity of 8.21 milliamp hour per centimeter squared. Um, we, we made amp hour cells. This is um, not, you know, this is not easily uh, done in a, in a lab, in an academic laboratory. Uh, and we achieved energy density that's above uh, 400 watt hour per kilogram. And volumetric uh, capacity that's um, energy sorry volumetric energy density that's uh, above 700. Uh, I should uh, explicitly point out that um, the these values uh, take into account the entire weight of the pouch cell housing um, uh, everything. The only thing it doesn't take into account is the weight of these tabs, which is relatively uh, small. Uh, and so if we Look at the uh, uh, aerial capacity at different current densities. Uh, we see that uh, the devices, these pouch cells, with um, our one key phase MOS2, compare favorably with um, other reports uh, in the in the in the literature. Here, we plotted the gravimetric energy density as a function of the volumetric uh, energy density uh, for different types of uh, uh, lithium sulfur as well as lithium ion batteries from uh, published reports, uh, even from, from, from companies. Uh, and we see that uh, we're able to get uh, uh, parameters that, that, that seem uh, promising. Of course, the key challenge with lithium sulfur batteries is the stability. Uh, so far, we've been able to achieve cells, pouch cells um, with, um, that retain uh, about 85% of their um, uh, a capacity for over 200 cycles. So this would sort of um, amount to, um, you know, a battery running for, for a few months uh, uh, in, a, in a device. Okay, so uh, I hope that uh, that sort of gives you a good overview of how this metallic 1T phase of MOS2 uh, can be used for a wide variety of different electrochemical uh, applications. It's really a fascinating uh, material. We've been working with it for the last 12 years um, and it always surprises us in terms of its, its uh, uh, capabilities. It's easy to, relatively easy to make. Um, and uh, I know that labs around the world uh, are making it, utilizing it for lots of interesting applications as well. Um, so with that, let me conclude by thanking uh, my uh, research group uh, the main work on lithium sulfur battery was done by Jung Nan Lee, who's a postdoc in my group. The main HER work was done by Dr. Jun Yang. She used to be in my group, and but now she's gone uh, to be taken assistant professorship in Kyungi University in Seoul. And also my previous postdoc, Damien Vori, uh, and of course all of these uh, funding agencies. So thank you very much for your uh, attention, and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, uh, to present uh, our work. And I'm happy to take any questions and engage in a panel discussion. Hopefully the questions are not too challenging. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manish, for a truly wonderful and excellent talk. Really fantastic. Uh, maybe I can take over sharing screens now. Yeah, let me stop sharing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so then uh, let me introduce the, the other panel members. So we have uh, today with us also Shelly Parrott. Uh, she obtained her undergraduates from Texas AMN University. And after a short break in industry for six years, she went back uh, to academia at UC Berkeley with uh, Paul Aliposato, as Jean Pierre said. And there she obtained her PhD. After that, she did a uh, postdoc with Paul Weiss at UCLA. And then she joined Purdue University, where she got associate professor with tenure in 2019. And she won really a lot of awards and, and other things, I think, way too many to mention. Today, we have also Tao Lee with us. Uh, he's a uh, professor at Southeast University in Nanjing. And he's also an associate dean of School of Material Science and Engineering. Um, his research covers nanoengineering, 2D materials, Internet of Things, and also 
uh, yeah, they are also important, these kind of wearable devices for healthcare oh, applications. Okay. Oh, okay. So maybe the way to and on, then right? the uh, I can next challenger I is Matthew Shi. He is now a research associate at the Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering at the Imperial College in London. Um, he completed his PhD studies also at College London in 2021. And his research focuses mainly on piezoelectric devices for energy harvesting and ambient sensing. So then perhaps we can uh, start with our uh, X challenger. So maybe you can start and open the discussion. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for your excellent talk. And uh, uh, I have several questions. The first question, hopefully I can come up with some challenging questions. And my first question is, is related to the soft actuator actually. So because I'm working on this uh, uh, in this field and uh, I'm very interested, uh, very interested in that uh, how fast is the actuator. And, and there, uh, do you think there are any like method to improve the speed of the actuator? And uh, my second question is related to the cost of the battery using MOS2. So uh, my question is like, uh, how do you evaluate the cost of the battery with the MOS2 and uh, compared, especially compared to the conventional methods? And uh, uh, how do you think that we can, uh, you can improve the, uh, improve the, uh, the, the, the battery in terms of price and cost before bringing it into a uh, factory? Thank you very much. Yeah, so in terms of uh, your, your first question regarding the uh, actuator, uh, so we did, um, when we published the paper in 2017, we, we did an analysis of the um, uh, actuation uh, frequency uh, and the the best that we could achieve was just a few hertz uh, uh, of the of the um, uh, actuation frequency. Um, so uh, I mean, obviously, uh, it, it you know that that will limit its applications. Um, but um, uh, you know, th those are sort of the the parameters that, that the maximum frequency that we were able to achieve was it was a few hertz. I mean, in terms of your second question about the economics of um, of uh, the lithium sulfur battery and 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 how do you make it cheap? I think there's there's a general, you know, move towards using materials that are inexpensive and earth abundant. So certainly, uh, MOS two qualifies, uh, you know, uh, as as that sort of uh, uh, material uh, because it's it's a byproduct of of uh, um, uh, copper purification and it's and molybdenite is a mineral that's found in, 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 in earth. So there's plenty of it and it's inexpensive. You can, uh, you know, buy tons of, of, of MOS2 if you want. And the challenge of course, is that, uh, you know, the, the kinds of materials that we're talking about, the one T phase, you know, requires some chemistry, uh, to be processed. And, and, and so, uh, the challenge with all, um, Electrochemistry, or or even uh, you know any discovery that's made in the in the laboratory, to translate that into into technology requires really scalable manufacture of the material. So even if you make the best electronic material, you need to go to you know twelve hundred millimeter wafer scale, right? If you make the best catalyst, then you need to demonstrate ton quantities. If you make the best electrode material for a battery, you need to demonstrate scalability and that's where the economics of, uh, uh, of uh, you know, these technologies, um, you know, is, is becomes critical and, um, you know, also a bottleneck and, and, and a huge, huge problem. So, so the economics will not, you know, if you just look at the material system, it's all very cheap and economical. Uh, but um, if you then think about scaling up, you know, then the cost of chemicals, the cost of materials, the cost of the process, um, all of that uh, has to be carefully considered using careful techno-economic analysis. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, then um, you have any more questions, Matsushi? Uh, no. Okay, then uh, let's move on to uh, our next panel member.
uh, maybe we can uh, go next to Tao Li. Hi, very nice talk, Manish. Can you Thank you. Me? All right. Yes, I can hear. Uh, Thank yeah. you. I, I think I more for familiar with the transistor rather than you know batteries or this kind of thing. So I'm asking this question actually to learn. So what's the common differences <clears throat> um, for the criteria to select the electro the metals contacting with the MOS2? Because I know you had the paper um, get the gold and enium to get good contact for the MOS transistors while you know, Jing Hong, they say the bismuth might be better. Anyway, so, but for this kind of battery or capacitors, this kind of application you mentioned today, what kind of key physical parameters that are important to select this kind of metal to in contact with MOS2 for the better performance? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, interfaces and, and, and contacts between, um, between materials uh, you know, becomes crucially important whenever you have charge transfer, right? Um, and in the case of, of uh, uh, the battery, uh, you know, these, these uh, electrodes are placed on, on copper uh, or, and or aluminum um, and, and the, the interface and the, and the contact between those, you know, have to be, have to be uh, very good. Uh, there's very little engineering. I mean, there, are, there is some engineering to be done, but there's very little flexibility uh, in moving away from these uh, materials because uh, they are quite cheap and well established within the, within the within the battery uh, field, uh, and so um, you, you know there are of course academics who who show that that if you uh, put graphene um, and then you can improve the, the, the you know the contact resistance or if you put niobium you know then, but you know with with you know, batteries, as with electronics, I mean, you know this uh, very well, um, the, the, uh, uh, it's, it's a commodity, right? I mean, it has to be cheap, you know? So, so you could have wonderful results using materials that work very well, but if they are, you know, expensive and, and difficult to produce in large quantities, uh, then, then uh, you know, the, the, um, there's, a, there's a huge problem uh, for, for the battery field. I mean, I can answer your question, you know, regarding for, for electronics, um, you know, the, the um, whether, you know, bismuth or indium, you know, the, what I, what I, when, when, when uh, I'm asked those questions in my electronics talk, what I tell people uh, is that um, don't really um, worry about the metal, right? Uh, so for example, bismuth is not practical neither is indium, right? But indium gold as an alloy could be uh, practical for, for devices. But, you know, it's not even, it's not even, uh, you know, the, the, the crucial thing is that the reason why bismuth and indium make very, very good contacts uh, for semiconducting uh, MOS2 uh, is because they're soft metals, right? So you can deposit them onto the substrate, onto the, 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 the three atom thick MOS2 or any other, uh, semiconducting TMDC uh, in a way that doesn't cause any damage at the interface and leaves the interface uh, very, very clean so that the Fermi level is not pinned, right? So that's the sort of advantage of bismuth and, and, uh, and indium. There's nothing special about uh, bismuth or uh, indium, in my opinion. It's just that, that because they have such low melting temperature, you can deposit them gently onto these very fragile uh, to the um, TMDCs, then you can apply. So one of the things that we've done in, in um, my group recently, um, which we hope will come out uh, somewhere soon, is that we've applied those principles of indium and bismuth deposition, this gentle uh, deposition uh, um, principles to deposit and make Van der Waals contact with even refractory metals like palladium and, and platinum. You can form same type of contacts um, that you form with indium and bismuth uh, with the heavy metals to get p-type devices. So um, what I would say is that it's not that, that bismuth is better than indium. It, you know, the, the principles of bismuth and indium are exactly the same, right? So it's not surprising for me that, that, that the bismuth works uh, as well, if not better than, 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 than indium. Um, that's not where the challenge is. The challenge is, is, is to really... Uh, now, because they both form N-type devices, and the real challenge in the 2D TMDC semiconductor field is making 
high quality P type uh, devices, right? Um, and so, so let's learn from bismuth and indium and see if we can use those principles, those deposition principles, to make good contacts, um, make good P type contacts with platinum and uh, palladium and other heavy metals. I think that is very interesting, and maybe to loop back also to the first question asked by the by the ex challenger. Uh, uh, about uh, a, bit, a little bit about scaling and also the new problems uh, you just highlighted. Um, what is now in general the reproducibility, the, the bets to bets reproducibility maybe? Uh, I couldn't help noticing that in many of your figures, I couldn't see any of the uh, error bars. So <laughs> <laughs> maybe you can comment a little bit on that. I mean, um, the, the, um, the, you know, for, 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 um, uh, the uh, some of the galvanostatic charge discharge and 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 the time um, or the different current densities you're making multiple measurements anyway right so so the the scatter in those measurements give you an indication of the error uh, but of course um, um, so the I mean in terms of you know reproducibility of the electrochemical devices. I would say the reproducibility is much higher than for electronic devices, Chris, uh, because um, in, in catalysis and in batteries, you have ensemble effects taking over, right? You have, you know, it's, it's basically a bulk system. So, and, and it's, it's a very sort of messy system, right? So, so you might have many, many different things going on, but the dominant one, you know, will dominate, right? And, and, and the, the, the non-dominant processes you just will not be able to see or measure, right? Unless you, so, um, so yeah, it, it's, it's a sort of a common joke in my group because I have a, a, a you know, a electrochemistry subgroup and I have electronic devices subgroup, right? And the electronic devices, people have the most expensive equipment um, for fab and for characterization. Uh, and the electrochemistry group has sort of very basic equipment, but they keep getting sort of, you know, reproducible devices and, 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 you know, versus making, you know, making P-type FETs with 2D TMDC semiconductors is an enormous challenge, you know, and, and, and you have to make, you know, hundreds of devices for tens of devices to work, you know, reproducibly, right? That versus making a, a pouch cell with a battery. Yes, you know, you might have some, some 20, 10, 20% difference in the capacity, uh, but that, battery will work, you know, that uh, coin cell will work, uh, you know, the catalysis measurements will, will work, right? So, um, so that's what I would say about reproduci reproducibility, that the electrochemistry is sort of ensemble effects that drown out some of the, versus an electronic device, you know, you just can't get away with, with any, any heterogeneity or defects or, or um, so your device simply fail, right? They just, it's not like you make a transistor that works. If it works and it's so bad with large hysteresis and things like that, so you know that it's, it's junk. Uh, so the tolerance level in electronic devices is much, much, uh, much tighter. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your honest answer. Tao Li, you have uh, more questions for the time, at the time being? All right, I, actually I do have one more. So for this kind of molybdenum disulfide application, this uh, energy device, let's say batteries or capacitors, um, I noticed that for the different phases, like 1T or 2H, they do have some significant performance change. Uh, my question is that during this kind of um, battery that they use, sometimes they might have some spike of the temperature with kind of this kind of like um, situation, will that cause the phase change of the MOS2? That might, you know, kind of degrade its material itself in the long run. So, thank you. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a that's a that's a great question, uh, uh, Tao. So, so I think you know the the um, the one T phase is is metastable, and if you do annul it to to high temperature, you get relaxation. But the thing that we found is that in catalysis measurements and in, in battery measurements. Uh, it's rare that, that I mean, we, we, we've actually never seen the, the, uh, the electrode sort of spontaneously phase convert or even with time uh, phase convert. Uh, it's very stable in terms of storage and because there's a, in, in, in the paper in 2013, we, we showed through calculations, there's actually quite a large activation barrier, 
for the relaxation of the face. So although the you know energy uh, difference um, once the phase transformation has occurred, it's quite low between the 1T and 2H. To mm -hmm. get over to that hump, there's a, there's a large energy barrier. So it is quite, uh, so we're not so worried about that aspect of it. All right, thank you. Yeah, no, thank you very much. So I see that we're also already getting uh, questions uh, from the online audience, but before we get to those, uh, let me move on to Shelley. Yeah, thanks for the great talk. I, I love this sort of panoramic view from the atomic scale and, and individual defects that you're introducing all the way out to, to real devices. Um, my, my background is in looking at monolayer chemistry on graphite and sometimes molybdenum disulfide. So I guess my, my first question had to do with all the way back at those those first measurements where you're, you're introducing defects and you're controlling where they are um, and you're showing that they introduce strain fields around them. I, I was curious what's known about when you have uncontrolled introduction of defects. You know, do, do they cluster? Do they distribute themselves? How would that relate to what a real device does? Yeah, no, thanks very much. That's, that's a great question. So, um, I mean, we've been studying um, defects in, in, in MOS2 from both the electronic point of view where you know, we were trying to minimize uh, you know, sulfur vacancies and really decrease the, the carrier concentration to get to sort of uh, you know, intrinsic uh, level. Uh, and then, but from, from a, it, it's interesting, right? From a catalysis point of view and even from, from a batteries point of view, how, having these sulfur vacancies is really useful as active sites, but also as sort of adsorption sites for the, for the, for the sulfur and ensuring that the polysulfide remains on the, on the, on the uh, electrode host rather than, than dissolving into the, into the electrolyte. So, um, so yeah, I mean, if, if every time we've looked at um, MOS2, whether it's mechanically exfoliated, chemically exfoliated, CVD grown, we see heaps of sulfur vacancies um, and, and uh, they're present. Um, they're um, usually isolated. So, so uh, we, 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 we did a study, uh, I guess it was a few years back now where we, uh, intentionally introduce sulfur vacancies using helium ion beam. The helium ion beam is very good at gently um, uh, introducing sulfur vacancies, knocking off uh, the sulfur uh, atoms without destroying the MOS2. So if you take something like xenon or argon, it's, it's very, you know, very big. So sometimes you damage the structure as well as removing the sulfur vacancy, but the helium allows you to sort of gently take off uh, the, 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 the sulfur atoms. And we, we, uh, increase the sulfur vacancy concentration by increasing the dose of the helium ion beam. Uh, and what we found was that essentially you have isolated sulfur vacancies up to a certain concentration. Um, can't remember what it is, but say on the order of around 10%. And then you start to create these dye vacancies. Um, it's interesting because we found that the molybdenum, uh, the, 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 the requirement for removing molybdenum uh, is much higher. You start to sort of, uh, you know, remove, once you have enough sulfur vacancies removed from the top surface, then you start creating sort of dye vacancies from the sulfur atoms below. Uh, and then if you go to very high helium ion dosages, then you start to remove the molybdenum uh, as well and destroying the framework of the, of the MOS2. That's really cool. So I guess one of the other things I was sort of curious about was like when I've worked with MOS2, it's you know sort of freshly cleaved and you know very clean interface and and to, to limit atmospheric adsorbates. And I think you're working in different environments, but I was curious whether there are parts of the processing that are designed to remove adventitious adsorbates or whether that's even a concern for the things that you're doing. Yeah, of course. Um uh, you know the 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 the, the main challenge with, with all of these sort of 2D materials is that um, oftentimes you have, um, you know, junk on the surface, uh, which has thickness values that are two, three times the thickness of the, of the, the material itself, right? Um, and, and so, um, so, so that is, uh, you know, a huge problem. Um, the chemical exfoliation process is, is um, you know, sort of, lends itself to ensuring that that doesn't happen because it's it's all sort of solvent based so there isn't yeah. sort of hydrocarbons or or, or yeah. uh, that sort of junk onto onto the onto the to the surface uh, for electronic devices of course that that is crucially important because it you know and one of the one of the coming back to Tao's question one of the challenges of making good p-type devices is not only making good contacts 
but also ensuring that you don't have doping from the environment, the substrate, the adsorbates, yeah. the the other things, right? So that's where you know these sort of things become uh, you know very very challenging. Um, and I think the community is sort of beginning to to realize that because you know in in transport actually oftentimes you can you can get away with 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 um, uh, you know. Um, you can demonstrate a transistor, but really, if you want to make really sensitive, good transport measurements, you have to make ultra clean, you know, uh, uh, samples. So, so for for that, you know, we have to work in in a glove box and ensure that everything's sort of sandwiched between HBN and things. For the electrochemical measurements, you know, a lot of the the processes themselves, um, you know, can can um, you know reduce the amount of impurities that that you introduce. Uh, into the into the into the material, and there's a much greater tolerance level, right? So when you make restacked electrodes that are, you know, uh, uh, from the sheets that are, you know, a few microns, then yes, there will be places where where you might have some heterogeneity, but that sort of, and that may influence the performance. But again, the ensemble effects are are greater than than sort of these minority effects. Yeah. So and then when you when you're processing, like, are there Parts of the sheet packing and the, the crumpling and things like that that you're able to control as as part of the, or, or not really. <laughs> no, no. I mean, we, we we don't we don't. I mean, there are people that that, that there are researchers, of course, that that, that are looking at crumpling um, and 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 sort of rationally introducing mesostructuring and and and, and nanostructuring and, and those types of things. Um, you know, those are sort of things that are very difficult uh, uh, to control. Again, you know. Um, coming back to the to the first question, you know, if you really think about scaling these things, you know, I mean, just to give you the kind of scale for batteries, you know, it's it's ridiculous. I mean, you know, a Tesla, for example, uses you know hundred thousand tons of graphite every year for for uh, for you know, I mean, that's that's, I mean, I can't even fathom the you know the quantity of so um, so you know you really need to uh, have the material uh, and to process it in a way. Where you're not doing sort of intricate, uh, you know. Oh, I guess I just meant sort of like very, very basic levels of the the process that that in practice control those things. I wasn't like you know here, please fold this in a zigzag pattern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, we we so, so the, the the kind of structures that I showed you um, are just a consequence of the the, the synthesis process that that yeah, you know yeah. that, that that we have, and I think that that you know. Uh, what is interesting about these restacked electrodes uh, is that, um, uh, um, for example, uh, in uh, in Japan, um, there's a group that has been looking at restacked um, uh, electrodes of of uh, atomically thin oxides and and lots of other materials. And what they find is that when you intercalate these things, the restacked electrodes are able to expand four, three, four hundred percent of their initial volume without uh, uh, crumb, uh, you know, disintegrating versus if you were to take a crystal of MOS2 and if you started intercalating different ions, you know, it would, it would disintegrate into and crumble uh, into, into small pieces. So, so that in itself, I mean, you don't want large volume expansion in a battery, of course, but uh, what, what it suggests is that they're very sort of uh, malleable in terms of allowing ions to come in and out uh, of, of, of their, their structure. So, so we found that, 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 just by you know natural processing, uh, uh, you know it, it seems to be sort of the right type of structure that that allows these, these processes to occur. That's fantastic. Thanks so much. Sure. Then uh, maybe I have uh, one brief question uh, before we go to the audience questions. I was also uh, intrigued by your activator. I think it was very neat to see how it uh, moved from at least uh, my perspective, left and right, when you change the voltage. Uh, so I was a bit curious about uh, the mechanism. Is the mechanism driven by volumetric changes associated with phase changes, or is it uh, charge intercalation and just electrostatic repulsion? What drives this little tiny no, activator? A, yeah, no, that, that's a good question because I didn't explain that uh, well enough. So what you have is um, it's a what's called a bimorph actuator. So you have a, a, a uh, a strip of poly uh, MI, which is quite thin, on which we put the MOS2. Uh, and as you sort of uh, intercalate, the MOS2 will um, uh, expand, right? Uh, but the but the poly MI will not, right? So there's a net sort of uh, force mm -hmm. that develops. Uh, and then when you actually de-intercalate, 
what happens is that the the, the, the spacing goes back, right? Ah, okay. Uh, and and so so then you're able to 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 actuate it. But isn't it, it's interesting because um, the the um, expansion you know and contraction is in fact when when you inter intercalate positive ions. Uh, you actually don't get expansion, you get contraction. Because if you have these sort of, the sheets are negatively charged uh, and the presence of positive ions actually decreases, in, it, it causes attraction towards the positive ions. It decreases the distance. And then when you remove, uh, you have an expansion, right? And that's the reason why you're able to sort of actuate in both directions, right? In principle, if if you expanded and then when you, Deintercalated, it came back to the original position. You'd only be able to actuate it in one direction. So we were a little bit confused when we showed that that by changing the polarity of the voltage, we we're able to go in both directions. Uh, and so uh, others have also seen this with other uh, two D uh, materials. When you intercalate positive ions, uh, and the solution process uh, sheets are actually negatively charged, so the positive ions in between the sheets causes uh, them to be attracted to the positive ions, and then that sort of decreased in the so that shrinkage, and it's counterintuitive, right? Because if you stick something between, you should have, uh, but um, our XRD results sort of seem to, to suggest that as well. Oh, that's very neat. And I think uh, my question then uh, for, yeah, goes into that as a nice transition to one of the questions of the audience. So this is a question from Ji Hong at uh, Changhua. And he says, or she says, thanks for your wonderful talk, for the activators in your talk. The drive voltage is 0.3 volts. Is this related with the dimension or not? Can it be even lower or not? Yeah, I mean that's that's a good question. Um, so the I think the the drive voltage is related to the um, the amount of voltage we need to um, intercalate and deintercalate. Um, I don't know if we can optimize that through the geometry of the of the actuator. We haven't explored that, but that's a good suggestion. Thank you for that. And then a uh, second question from the audience. Uh, dear Prof Manish, amazing talk for the Pouchel. Congratulations. I'm wondering uh, for the temperature range and uh, stability. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a, of course that's a wonderful question. Thank you for that. Um, we haven't tested the temperature range right now. It certainly works under ambient uh, conditions. You know, Cambridge conditions, which are always a bit cold uh, and and wet. Um, but uh, we, we've got to try them in Singapore uh, conditions. Uh, Chris, you know, the humidity levels and the temperature levels. Uh, and then also in, in uh, uh, the cold temperatures, maybe someone from Dalian or uh, the cold part of China will know that, that you know, uh, these batteries have to work in cold. So, of course, those are the kinds of things that we need, to, we need to test for before we can say that these, uh, you know, this technology is... is, is um, of course, the, the main problem with lithium sulfur batteries, we've only focused on this on the cathode side, right? But um, the 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 problem with lithium sulfur batteries is the pure lithium anode, right? If you replace um, carbon with pure lithium in a lithium ion battery, you also get very good performance, right? But we don't do that because there's huge safety concerns with pure lithium, right? So it's not clear why pure lithium anode would be acceptable in a lithium sulfur battery when it's not acceptable in a lithium ion battery. Right, so, so, so I, I don't want everyone in the audience to get excited about you know, uh, uh, yes, the the one T phase MOS two works well um, as the you know, sulfur host on the cathode side, but our our aim was not to necessarily make the best lithium sulfur battery in the world. Uh, you know, when I wrote the proposal, um, I listed the the different properties of one T MOS two, and I said, hmm, this could be interesting. For lithium sulfur batteries, right? And it turns out that that you know because of those properties, it works quite well. But it doesn't mean that we solve the problem of lithium sulfur batteries because the electrolyte is a huge problem, and the lithium anode. For me, you know, I would not want to buy a, a battery with pure lithium anode. You know? So so maybe uh, you know th th there are still lots of outstanding problems that 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 are that are left. I, I think I think it's it's important to say and point out those sort of things. No, thank you uh, very much. I see that we are also uh, getting now very close to the yeah, to the end. Uh, so I would like maybe then uh, to thank uh, Professor Manish uh, one time for an excellent talk and and really nice discussions. Yeah, then 
I would only uh, highlight then uh, next week's uh, uh, episode, which will already be volume 99. So that is only one shy of the magical big number of 100, which will be a tribute to the, all of those uh, in Shanghai. And then there will be three speakers, uh, Fang Wang, Martin Fuo, and Zi Hong Ni. And the moderators will be Lao Fu. And of course, who else than Alice? Well, hope to see you all uh, next week again. Bye-bye. Thanks very much. Bye.